Ecclesiastes, uh, starting chapter 1, verse 12. I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also the madness of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is chasing after the wind. For much wisdom comes from much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasures to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself up with wine and embracing folly. My mind still guided me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water, groves of flourishing trees. I brought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasures of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing in the eyes I desired. I refused my heart's no pleasures. My heart took delight in all labour, and this was the reward of my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than that has already been done? I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise have eyes in their heads, while fools walk in darkness. But I came to realise that the same fate overtakes them both. Then I said to myself, the fate of the fool will overcome me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said to myself, this too is meaningless, for the wise, like the fool, will not be long remembered. The days have already come when they both have been forgotten. Like the fool, the wise too must die. So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I have toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Yet they will have control over all of the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and my skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labour under the sun. For a person may labour with wisdom and knowledge and skill. They must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labour under the sun? All their days, their work, their grief and pain... Even at night, their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. A person can do nothing better than eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom and knowledge and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless a chasing after the wind. Thank you, Jeff. It's not a terribly happy story, uh, but it is a helpful story, and that's why we're going to pull it apart this morning. Uh, keep your Bibles open so you can follow as we do that. There's a bit of repetition, but there's also a progression through, and it'll be good for you to be able to see that as we read it together. 
Uh, I don't know if it ever strikes you, um, you know, while you're watching TV and watching particularly the ads. You know, sometimes they just kind of wash over you, but sometimes you actually stop and, and see those ads and, and, and sit back and think, isn't this utterly ridiculous, what these ads are trying to show me? Isn't, isn't it totally absurd? And I'm not just talking about the, the plain stupid ads, you know, the, the shiploads yarn ad. I don't know if you've seen that. That one drives me insane. I can't even... But be advertising beyond that as well. Um, someone once told me that advertising's changed in the last generation or so. Uh, it used to be advertising was, here's a product, buy this product. Whereas advertising now is more like, here's, here's a lifestyle, you want this lifestyle, and our product just so happens to be associated with that lifestyle. Now, sometimes that's kind of plausible. You know, you watch Coke ads, and everyone's having fun and partying, and they're all drinking Coke, and you're like, that's, that's the Coke lifestyle. They're also healthy and skinny. It doesn't explain how that's possible, but, but that's the Coke lifestyle. Or, you know, they sell four-wheel drives, and everyone's outdoorsy, and it's rugged, and it's, it's, it's that blokey lifestyle, and that's associated with owning a four-wheel drive, and that, that kind of, in some ways, makes sense. But sometimes the associations are weird, aren't they? I don't know if you've caught the Hotondo ad. You know, here's your Hotondo ad, and when you have a Hotondo home, your home is filled with happy children who are obedient, and they do lovely, quiet activities like playing outside or drawing pictures, and your dog is perfectly behaved, and everyone's smiling all the time. That's a Hotondo home. That's get that home, you have that lifestyle. Isn't that amazing? Why didn't we build with a tondo? Uh, actually, my favourite though, my favourite though at the moment is the new Kia ad. I don't know if you've seen this one. It's, you know, nighttime scene, it's raining, it's, it's really edgy in the way it's filmed and it's of a racetrack and, you know, performed by a racing driver under controlled circumstances and there's revving motors and squealing tyres. You'll be cool and speedy if you drive this car, which is a minivan. <laughs> <laughs> like, that, that's not... New dads, you know, you can be cool still whilst driving a minivan. That's not true. <laughs> Just in case... I'm very sorry. It's not true. <laughs> you give that up. It's absurd, isn't it? It is completely ridiculous. When you think about these lifestyles, you think about the associations, but it is so telling... It's so telling. See, they're not trying to sell us something that we don't want, aren't they? They're trying to sell us something that we do want. We want that lifestyle. We want a fulfilled lifestyle. We want a content lifestyle, an exciting lifestyle, a vibrant lifestyle. We want to be happy. <laughs> like all these people in the ads are happy. We want that. Now, usually we're sensible enough to know that Yes, why we might need and buy those products. We know that they won't make us happy. But what does? What will make us happy? Is it actually possible to be happy? Does that lifestyle exist? Now, you might think Ecclesiastes is a weird book to go to to find out how to be happy, because it is not a happy-sounding book, is it? And yet, it is the perfect place. Because despite all his pessimism, the teacher in Ecclesiastes says, it is there. That lifestyle isn't just a myth, it's not just a pipe dream, it does exist, it is possible to be happy. But it's not where you might think. We're going to see that today. Now a friend the teacher tells us, he's clearly in his older age, he's, he's, he's moved through the prime of his life and he's looking back and he says, I wanted that life. I wanted that good and happy life. And he said, so I resolved myself that I was going to do anything it took to get that life. And the book is his list of experiences of that. He, he announces it in, in verse 12 there of chapter 1. I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Now, whether the teacher is Solomon himself and just writing a bit obscurely or whether it's someone else a bit later taking on that kind of persona, either way, the point stands. He has looked at the world, he's looked at everything under the sun and he has seen something. Life is hard. We're under a heavy burden, he says. Why? 
because of that refrain that we saw last week and that we're going to see throughout this book, meaningless. Things are empty. Things are insubstantial. Things are fleeting. And that is life under the sun. But what if we could work our way out from under that? What if we could somehow escape or move past all that meaningless? What, what if we could get past that and truly be happy? Well, the teacher says, I'll try. Look at verse 15. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. The teacher says, I'm going to be smart. And not just smart, I'm not just going to get knowledge, I'm going to be wise. That is, understand how to use that knowledge well. The world is crooked, uh, the world's lacking. Perhaps, you know, in searching all of this out, in searching for wisdom and knowledge, maybe, maybe I can figure a way to straighten it or figure a way to understand, you know, despite that and, and achieve the path to happiness. Maybe I can find the answer. And so he searches every path. He grows in wisdom. He grows in knowledge. He says, look, I'm even going to go the other side of the tracks. I'll look into madness and folly as well, just in case it's there too. And he's done it more than anyone else. You know, he's read every self-help book in the library. He, he's been to every guru and res- explored all religions and beliefs and philosophies. He's, he's even dabbled in conspiracy theories. He's, he's been everywhere. And his conclusion is, it's a chasing after the wind. That is, it's a striving for something that cannot be grasped. Why? Because he says, the more you know, the more pain and confusion you uncover. It's like, you know how, they don't actually advert, uh, they don't offer tours of sausage factories. I don't know if you've ever realised that. Uh, they never let you into, you know, four and twenty pies to see how they're made or the places, you know, where they make chicken nuggets. Now, you might be curious about how those things are made, but I think we could all agree that if you saw how they were made, you might not ever enjoy them again. <laughs> uh, you, you, don't, you don't want to know that because it would spoil it, don't you? Um, this week, there, there was a, someone posted a TikTok. Um, if you don't know what a TikTok is, ask your grandchildren. Uh, someone posted a TikTok of how they make KFC gravy. Uh, an employee said, this is how we make gravy. Most of the people who watched it now will never eat gravy again. It, knowing stuff doesn't make you happy. In fact, sometimes knowing stuff makes you very uneasy or even disappointed or even, as the teacher says, grieved. More often the case is the more you know, the more down you get because the further you dig into the world, the further you dig into how things really are, the more you learn just how crooked and how lacking this world is. Knowledge is not a path to happiness. It's most often a case of the very opposite. But what about pleasure itself? What about indulgence? What about extravagance? Well, the teacher says, been there, done that, and here's what it's like. Look at chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness, and what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects, I built houses for myself and planted vineyards, I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them, I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees, I I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house, I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me, I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces, I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. The teacher says, 
I've been everywhere, man. <laughs> I have done everything. That might not be your bucket list of great achievements. I don't know if you want to make plant great orchards and water them. But, but this is it. Like, he's done everything. He's done what great people did. He's done fun and partying. He's done projects and achievement. He's had gold and glory and girls. He's had everything anyone could dream about. And he's done it far beyond anyone that, that ever lived. Uh, as a case in point, um, we're told one year, you know, if this is in case, Solomon, um, one year his income was 25 tonnes of gold. That's roughly a billion dollars. That's let alone all the other stuff he acquired that year. So, like, he was rich. He'd done it all. And he says, I didn't do it stupidly. You know, I wasn't an idiot about this. All the while through, I, I stayed wise. I did it well. I never lost my head. And yet, what does he say at the end of all that chasing? Verse 10. I denied myself nothing my eye, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. The work in itself provided some sense of reward, some sense of fulfillment, but that was it. It was, it was fleeting and it was gone and when he had, he sat back and realised he had, with all that stuff, no satisfaction, no happiness. It's all nothing. Now there's an episode of The Simpsons uh, and, and Homer says to Mr Burns, his boss, you're the richest man I know. And Mr. Burns replies, yes, but I'd trade it all for more. That's it, isn't it? I, it's, it's empty. The getting doesn't count. It doesn't, it, the having means nothing. It's unfulfilling. It's, it's unsatisfying. Uh, when you get home later, uh, Google the song uh, Hurt by Johnny Cash. It's actually a, a Nine Inch Nails song, but he covers it beautifully. And Watch the film clip as well, because it's, it's Johnny Cash in his later years. Like he's, he's an old man by now, uh, and he's singing this, this, this song, and he's looking back on his life, and this is how the chorus goes. You could have it all, my empire of dirt. That's how he sums up his life, my empire of dirt. That's the teacher, isn't it? Everything I've worked for, everything I have toiled and laboured and strived, everything I've gathered for myself, it's dirt. It doesn't count for anything. It's not worth anything. It's meaningless. Knowing lots just gave me more pain. Having lots does not mean being lots. There is no gain. There's no profit in either. There is no happiness in having these things. And his warning stands for us. It's as true in our day as it is in his. You can investigate every self-help book and every philosophy. You can go on retreats to, to find yourself or to find something. You can explore every hidden knowledge, search for the key to life wherever you like, travel to Nepal or wherever the latest place to travel to is. And it's not there. Happiness, the answer, fulfillment, purpose, meaning, you won't find it. It's meaningless. It's empty. It's futile. You can pursue anything and everything your heart desires, whatever, whatever your next is. You can, you can invest yourself into, into cryptocurrency. You can learn all about it and maybe even make a killing off it. You can work the stock market or the property market. You might even be the most successful in the country at it. You can have the Instagram-worthy you know, van life, uh, done with all the possessions, let's have the experience and travel the country or the world. Uh, you can have the, the, the best sex life, you can have the nicest food, the greatest alcohol, whatever it is you want. And it's not there either. It is a long pursuit with no destination. You will never arrive. Happiness won't be found or achieved, that hunger won't be filled and your appetite will never be sated. It is a chasing after the wind. And there's another fly in the ointment. 
as if that wasn't dark enough. The great equaliser itself, uh, death itself. The, the teacher comes quite abruptly to this realisation. We, we see it in, in chapter 2, verse 12. He says, Then I turn my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than it has already been done? I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise have eyes in their heads while the fool walks in the darkness. But I came to realise that the same fate overtakes them both. Then I said to myself, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said to myself, this too is meaningless. For the wise, like the fool, will not be long remembered. The days have already come when both have been forgotten. Like the fool, the wise too must die. There were none wiser than the teacher. There would be none after the teacher who were wiser than him. And he says, yes, wisdom in itself is a good thing. Is it, you know, much like being in a room with the lights on is better than being in a room with the lights off. It is good. But both the wise and the foolish wind up in the same place. There comes a day when it counts for nothing. They're both six feet under. You might be the smartest person who's ever lived, and yet your end is the same as the dumbest. Both die, and to what gain? What, what difference, what profit have you achieved beyond that of the fool? And it's not just in wisdom. Look at verse 17. So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I'd told for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil which I poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toils and labour under the sun. For a person may labour with wisdom, knowledge and skill and then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all their toil and anxious striving with which they labour under the sun? All their days their work is grief and pain. Even at night their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. There were, there were none richer, there were none more accomplished than the teacher, and yet when he dies, what does it come to? It comes to someone else. And who knows what they're going to do with it? He, his riches seem good, and yet his death brings such an abrupt end to all of it. And then this, this empire, this dynasty that he has laboured to create, this, this, uh, all his, his possessions and works, who knows what's going to happen to them once he's gone? In fact, if this is actually Solomon writing, we know that his very own son split his kingdom in two through, through gross foolishness and mismanagement. You work and you work and you labour and you invest yourself only for the one after you to squander everything that you have put together. Uh, my, my whole life uh, and before I was even born, uh, my dad worked his tomato farm um, it was his dad's before him. Uh, I, I don't know how many years, at least 40 years, he, he invested himself into that farm. And it, it wasn't a fancy farm. Uh, it wasn't modern. It wasn't even that big. But he worked that farm well. Uh, he, he poured himself into it. He, he looked after it. You know, it was the sort of place where nothing stays broken for long, where, where there was never any mess. It, it was tidy. It was functional. Uh, and it was effective. I don't, I don't really like tomatoes, but everyone says that the tomatoes he grew were really nice. I'll, I'll take their word for them. And for years he poured himself into it. And then finally, a while back, he sold it. Only to watch the person who came after him run the place into the ground. Not care about it, not know how to take care of it, not know how to produce anything of it. And when you drive past it now, the place is a ruin. It looks like a junkyard. Meaningless. A chasing after the wind. The bottom line of all of our endeavours is death. Death ends wisdom, 
Death makes futile your efforts. Life is limited. All you strive for is temporary. So what happiness could there be then? Life sucks and then you die. That's a weird, <laughs> weird summary to get from the Bible, but that's this passage, isn't it? Life sucks, then you die. That's hateful. It's, it's, it's infuriating. I mean, you see what he says. So I hated life, and it's no wonder. Is there, there anything worse than that frustration, that, that futility? And yet that's the truth. If you pursue happiness in this world, you will come to hate life. You will come to despair because it cannot be found. All of these achievements upon which we think we can set our happiness, all of them will be cut down by one thing or another. You know, sporting records are, are broken. New goats, greatest of all times, are, are arise to take that title. Uh, theories once thought flawless are, are, are disproved. New research contradicts old research. All your savings will one day be distributed by your family and probably in ways you wouldn't approve of. Your kids will one day look through your photo albums, you know, the record of all your life and achievements, and they will throw most of them out. Your business will be sold or passed on, and the one who comes after you will change it, will break it up, will cause it to fail. Your house will be renovated by someone else who mocks your design choices. <laughs> as you've mocked the person before you. How hateful! How meaningless is it all? It is so empty. Nothing that you've worked for comes to anything in the end. It is futile and pointless. That's the pursuit of happiness in this world. The searching will consume you, and it will frustrate you, and then you die. Now, if you're listening to this and you're not a Christian, then what we've talked about so far might actually confirm some of your suspicions about Christianity. So <laughs> the Christians are said to be killjoys, uh, where everyone says we're, we're anti-progress, anti-sex, anti-fun, anti-everything. And it kind of feels like it so far, doesn't it? Well, if that's the case, then the next section of this passage might come as a little bit of a surprise. Look at the start of verse 24. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. Uh, nothing better is not like, you know, this is, I guess, the bare minimum, uh, you know, how we say it's, oh, it's not bad. Uh, nothing better is, this is the best thing. This is, this is the best thing for you to do in life. Yes, life sucks, then you die, so eat, drink and be merry and be satisfied or be happy, enjoy life. But how? <laughs> how can we stick these two things together you know, in just one verse? I hate life, so go and live life and enjoy it. <laughs> how do you do that? How can we be happy in this futile and temporary stuff? Well, the difference is there. The difference is right there at the end of that verse. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without Him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. See, there's the difference, isn't it? There's the key here. There can be happiness, there can be true enjoyment, even in the things of this earth. But not if they're pursued, only if they're received as gifts. Not if they're chased after, but only if they're given. Now, that's, that's essential to this passage here. Now, it it's, it's, seems contradictory to it, or it seems uh, really countercultural, doesn't it? You know, we think if we want something good, go out and get it. You know, don't wait for it to come to you. You go out, you take hold of it. Grab it. You know, the, the go-getter, that's who, that's who we celebrate. Don't trust anyone else to do it for you. Do it for yourself. And the teacher says, no. Striving for it, chasing after it, doesn't work. To get it, 
You must trust and be given it and receive. There's a, there's a great scene in one of uh, C.S. Lewis's fiction books. Um, you've probably heard of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Well, there's a, there's a prequel to that. It's called The Magician's Nephew. Uh, and in this story, in this book, there is a garden. And in the garden, there is a special tree. And that special tree bears a special fruit. And that fruit grants the desires, the deep desires, of anyone who eats it. And in the book, two characters get that fruit. One is Jadis, the sorceress. Uh, she sneaks in, she breaks into that garden and grabs it for herself. And it gives her her deep desires. It gives her power and long life. But it torments her and it causes her terrible anguish. The other character is Diggory. Here's a name we don't hear too often, Diggory. It's lovely, just in case you're looking for names. Diggory is told to seek that fruit and it is given to him and he receives it and for him that same fruit gives him his deep desires it's wholesome it makes his mother well it grants what he's been looking for but the difference is it's given and the teacher says that's the case here too if you seek and if you strive and if you pursue and try to suck the marrow of this life dry in order to find that happiness and fulfill your purposes, you may get something on the journey, but ultimately it is futility and death. But if you receive as a gift of God, not chasing, not striving, but enjoying what he's given, there is happiness there to the person who pleases him, God gives. Now we don't read that and resolve, okay, well I'm going to do everything I can so that I please God in order that he'll give to me. That, that's, that's not him, that's not it at all. That's, that's just simply more fruitless striving that's missing the mark or, or sin as this passage calls it. Instead, the imperative then is go to him. Trust him. Rather than chasing life or chasing him as a means to life, chase him that pleases him that receives from him can we can we do that can we give up all our running for happiness all our striving for happiness and simply trust <laughs> it sounds risky doesn't it you know to put all our eggs in that basket to put all our hope for happiness and life in his hands rather than our own But we can trust because his hands are good and he's shown it this is what it says in Romans chapter 8 verse 32 he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all how will he not along with him graciously give us all things he has given the most costly the most important thing he has given us his own beloved son to death on a cross, a death that forgives sinners like us, a death that rescues from death itself and futility. And he's given that freely to anyone who trusts him, life itself. How much more will he not also give us all things? That is a God who can tr we can trust. The sinner, that is the one who keeps on striving, who keeps on pursuing apart from God, he will seek and he will seek and he will search and he will gather fruitlessly. He will end nowhere but death. Meaningless. The pleaser of God, that is him who trusts God, he will seek God and he will find God and in God find happiness. Not in chasing happiness, but in having God and all that God gives. And he will live joyfully and contentedly and happily. So stop chasing the wind. Stop pursuing what you can't have. And simply receive God good, God's good gifts here and now. 
what, what's before you, what's in your life, what's in front of you. Simply enjoy it. Enjoy it and find happiness in it. I mean, it's, it's something we learned last year, isn't it? We, it's something we, we had to learn <laughs> during lockdown. We couldn't go and do, we couldn't get and have and, and, and be busy and rush and strive for stuff. We just had to live with what we had. And it not it remarkable how much satisfaction that we found in that, in simply having and enjoying what we already had? Well, we'll keep realising that. In fact, expand that. <laughs> Give up your restless striving. Give up your searching for happiness. It's not out there. Instead, count what God has given and enjoy it and be satisfied. And trust Him to keep giving you all the good that you need. Chasing the wind is futile. It's empty. It's disastrous. But trusting in God is full. It is the only happy life because it is life itself. It's life now and it's life that lasts forever. There is nothing better than eating and drinking and enjoying your work and your place in life as God's good gifts to those who please him, to those who are in his son Jesus. And so rest there and be happy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to see the futility in pursuing happiness and fulfilment in this world. Lord, we, we need to see it because it's just so easy for us to get caught up in chasing it. And you know, we, we think that we, we have to grab it, we have to do whatever's necessary to get it for ourselves. But it's not true. Please forgive us for, for chasing it unthinkingly in this way. Father, remind us that this happiness can't be caught, that it can only be given, and that you do give it freely and generously and wonderfully. We see it in Jesus so clearly and we ask that you would help us to trust. Help us to find our happiness in you and be content. Help us to live happily with what you've given us to do it with you and, and for you, in your name and, and for your sake. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.